real estate mortgage as embodied under the Civil Code of the Philippines. Um, this will be a discussion of real estate mortgage as embodied under Article 2124 to Article 2131 of the Civil Code. Okay, so real estate mortgage is also is also interrelated with pledge, although um, the provisions of the law are more specific. And aside from the um, civil code, there are also special laws that govern the provisions of real estate mortgage. So let's go with our discussion one by one. So what is real estate mortgage? Okay, so it is a contract whereby the debtor secures to the creditor the fulfillment of a principal obligation, especially subjecting to such security, immovable property, or real rights over immovable property in case the principal obligation is not complied with at the, same, at the time stipulated. So um, if you will analyze the definition of the real estate mortgage, it is somewhat synonymous with pledge, right? Okay, like in pledge, it also secures the fulfillment of a principal obligation. So uh, a thing is being used as a collateral or as a security. But the main difference with this one for real estate mortgage is it is a immovable property. Okay, so such security is an immovable property or real rights over immovable property. Okay, so it will answer just in case or if the principal obligations are not complied at the time stipulated. So please take note of that definition. This is embedded under Article 2124. Although there is no exact um, terms as defined because in 2124, um, the only uh, thing that is mentioned in this provision is the subject matter or the object of the real estate mortgage, which is an immovable property. Okay, so immovables or alienable real rights in accordance with law imposed upon immovables. Nevertheless, movables may also be object of a chattel mortgage. So real mortgage that is immovable property, um, chattel mortgage is on movable properties or personal properties. Okay, so what are the characteristics of a real mortgage? So what are the characteristics? First, it is a real contract, real meaning to say there should be delivery of the subject matter, okay? So just like what uh, we discussed with um, the contract of pledge, when we discuss um, pledge as also a real contract, since it is perfected by the delivery of the thing, which is being mortgage or pledge by the debtor, Okay, it's called the pledger and the creditor. So it's, it is perfected by the delivery. Then second characteristics is accessory. When can you say that the contract is accessory? It is when it has no independent existence of its own. So it cannot stand by itself alone. It is just dependent upon the principal obligations, the principal contract, which is um, practically the contract of loan or the loan agreement between the debtor and the creditor. And the real estate market serves as an accessory contract. Then it is subsidiary. What does it mean when we say subsidiary? It is, um, it would mean that the obligation incurred does not arise until the fulfillment of the principal obligation which is secured okay so it can it is just subsidiary to the principal contract um which is the loan okay loan agreement or a contract of loan or another uh, principal obligation and last characteristics is it is unilateral okay when you can say that it's unilateral because it creates only an obligation on the part of the creditor who must free the property from the encumbrance once the obligation is fulfilled. 
okay no one's that the loan has been satisfied or has been fully um extinguished it creates the obligation on the part of the creditor or the mortgagee okay to free that property subject of the encumbrance so those are the four characteristics of a real mortgage now in addition to the common essential requisites of a real mortgage um, under article 2124 article 2125 of the civil code it provides that it should also include the following okay so it can only cover immovable property and alienable real rights imposed upon immovables okay in the definition i mean in, in the provision of the civil code on article 2124 it says here that a the object of a contract of mortgage would include immovables and alienable rights in accordance with law imposed upon immovables second is what is found in article 2125 second requirement this is an essential requirement it must appear in public instrument okay the contract of um the real estate mortgage the agreement on the real estate mortgage must be must be notarized it must appear in public instrument it is indispensable okay that it is in a public instrument and the third essential requisite which is also in addition to the to the to the basic requisites of a contract of real mortgage is the registration in the registry of property which is necessary to bind third persons but not for the validity of the contract okay that is also found in the um, second paragraph of article 2125 okay so um, this is peculiar to a contract of mortgage because real mortgage because it is to be registered in the registry of property meaning to say yeah, the the parties to the contract must go to the register of deeds have it um registered see what we are here okay so it is to be annotated in the title of the immovable property. So it says here that in order for the mortgage may be validly constituted that the document in which it appears to be recorded in the register of deeds. And the instrument is, if the instrument is not recorded, the mortgage is nevertheless binding between the parties. So the registration is not on will not affect the validity okay it's still a valid contract of real estate mortgage but the only effect is it will not bind third persons meaning to say if the real estate mortgage is not annotated in the title and let's say the property has been sold by the owner okay the mortgage that is attached there on if the third party is a buyer in good faith um it will not be valid against him Okay, so it will not bind third persons because if there is registration, it becomes a notice to the whole world and such registration would bind necessarily bind third persons. Nevertheless, even if there is no registration in the registry of property, it's still a valid contract of pledge. I mean, uh, real estate mortgage. Okay. So here are some of the important provisions, important notes that you should consider when it comes to real estate mortgage. Um, first, as a necessary contract, its consideration is that of the principal contract from which it receives life, okay? Be being an accessory contract. So it depends upon the existence of the principal contract. If the principal contract is extinguished, necessarily the contract of real mortgage would also be extinguished and also you should take note that a mortgage does not involve transfer okay does not involve a transfer session or conveyance of property but only constitute a lien thereon 
It's only a lien on over that immovable property. So until discharge, it follows the property wherever it goes and subsists notwithstanding changes of ownership. Okay, that's why it is to be registered in the registry of property so that even if there is transfer of ownership, because later on you will know that there is a provision in the civil code that um, there should not be a stipulation uh, prohibiting the alienation of the property being mortgaged. So if there is alienation or there is sale or transfer, the real estate mortgage would still subsist. Okay, it creates a lien over the property and it goes wherever would be the owner. So um, if there is a proper annotation or there is proper registration of that real mortgage, even if it is transferred, there would be assumption of that mortgage by the new owner. Okay, that's what that proof that that um actually this is um from the decisions of the Supreme Court in a in a line of um, cases, okay, involving real estate mortgage. Also, a mortgage gives the mortgagee no right or claim to the possession of the property. And therefore, a mere mortgagee has no right to eject an occupant of the property mortgage unless the mortgage should contain some provision to that effect. Okay. Later on, you will know also that in real estate mortgage, the possession is not surrendered, unlike pledge, okay, unlike pledge, unlike chattel mortgage, no, no chattel mortgage, unlike pledge. If um, in pledge there is transfer of possession, diba? Although there is delivery, delivery should be uh, would either be constructive, diba? So there is that um, you 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 get the copy of the title to be to be um, under the custody of the mortgagee, but the mortgagee cannot claim possession over the property. It would still be the mortgager who will um, occupy the property, or if there are other um, occupants who are entitled legally entitled there to the mortgagee cannot expect to eject that um, property okay I mean that that could occupant on the property the only right of the mortgagee in case of non-payment of a debt secured by the mortgage would be to foreclose the mortgage okay and have the encumbered property sold to satisfy the outstanding indebtedness now, if possession is transferred to the mortgagee, it must not expressly be for purpose of applying the fruits to the interest or then to the principle of the credit for then it would be an anticrisis. Because anticrisis is also another form of a credit transaction. It's a different kind of contract. And you will learn that later on um, in another topic. Okay. All right. Sorry. Now, another important thing to consider um, on real mortgage is it is not essential requisite that the principal of the mortgage credit bears interest. Okay, so it doesn't matter. It's not an essential requisite. And that the interest as compensation for the use of the principal and enjoyment of the fruits be in the form of a certain percent thereof. Okay. Now, what is the effect if there is an invalid mortgage? Let's say the mortgage, the real estate mortgage was not notarized, it did not appear in public instrument, or if it is um, fraudulently made, or there is no uh, actually property that is used as a collateral, what is the effect on the principal obligation? Okay, so in, in a decision of the Supreme Court, it mentioned that where a mortgage is not valid or false, the principal obligation which it guarantees is not rendered null and void. Okay, it's not rendered null and void. What is lost only is the right to foreclose the, pro the mortgage as a special remedy for satisfying or settling the indebtedness 
which is the principal obligation, but the mortgage deed remains as evidence or proof of a personal obligation of the debtor and the amount due to the creditor may be enforced in an ordinary personal action. Okay, so it will not affect the principal obligation. It will not render the principal obligation null and void, even if the real mortgage is uh, false or it is not valid or um, it was fraudulently made or it, it is not notarized. It did not comply with the necessary requisites for its validity. So in that particular case, um, the, the creditor mortgagee no longer has the right to foreclose the mortgage kasi wala ang valid mortgage. So if the debtor would fail to comply with this obligation to pay, it would be specific performance personal action, okay, specific performance and at foreclosure of the mortgage, okay. Now, what are the kinds of mortgage? So, we have here voluntary real estate mortgage, legal real estate mortgage, and the third one is what you called equitable mortgage. So, um, when can you say that it is voluntary? It is voluntary if it is agreed upon by the parties or constituted by the will of the owner of the property on which it is created. Okay, so mutual agreement of the party, that's voluntary um, mortgage. Second is the legal mortgage or one which is required by law to be executed in favor of certain persons. And the persons in whose favor the law establishes a mortgage have no other right than to demand the execution and the recording of the document in which the mortgage is formalized. Okay, that's actually Article 2125, Paragraph 2 of the Civil Code. Okay, so legal mortgage, it is created by law. And um, the only thing that is um, to be demanded from there is the execution and recording of that document. Okay, now the third one is the equitable mortgage. Maybe this is not new to you if you have studied your uh, contract of sales. It is a contract or it is a, actually it's a mortgage, but um, it is a contract that, for instance, it's a uh, sale with the right to report chase. A deed of sale with the right to report chase. And the consideration or the selling price is um, very low. And there is that provision there that um, after, let's say, two years, um, the property will be repurchased by the seller okay, um, at a certain amount, okay, let's say, plus interest on the uh, that selling price. So it lacks the formalities of a mortgage, right? Because what was um, uh, executed was a deed of sale with a right to repurchase or pacto de retro sale. Okay, so it is one which lacks, although lacking the formalities of mortgage, but the true intentions of the parties is to make the property as a security of a debt. So that amount that has been uh, used as a selling price price, which is considerably low, usually it's shocking to the cons. And let's say if you have a $5 million worth of property, it was just sold for 500000 with the right to report chase within two years with an interest of 10% per annum. So the intention of the parties is to make just the property as a security of the debt for that amount of 500000 and that the seller there will reacquire the property Okay, repurchase that property. So parang binayaran lang niya yung kanyang utang. Okay, and the property will also be released. Okay, so there is no registration yet because there's right to repurchase and um, practically under the civil code, it is to be considered as an equitable mortgage. All right, now how do we distinguish pledge from mortgage? So I think you already have an idea on, on the first um, two distinction of 
a pledge and mortgage. So first, pledge is constituted on movables. So on movables, on personal properties. Whereas real mortgage is constituted on immovables or real properties. Now in pledge, the property is delivered to the pledgee or by common consent to a third person. It's of the pledgee or to a third person. So it's very indispensable that the property should be delivered. Okay. Second, the delivery in, in, the, in real estate mortgage, on the other hand, the, sec the delivery is not necessary, okay? Delivery is not necessary. Meaning to say there is no physical transfer of possession. But there is delivery, kasi nga, real contract. Um, what is mentioned here is there's no physical delivery of the property. Um, <clears throat> physical possession by the mortgagee, okay? So the mortgagee would still be in possession of the property. Whereas in pledge, there is transfer of possession. All right, and the third um, distinction is um, not valid against third person unless a description of the property pledge and the date of the pledge appear in public instrument. Okay, so it's pledge. Whereas in real mortgage, um, it is not valid against third person unless registered. Okay, so binding upon the parties even if it is not notarized or registered but it will not bind the whole world okay it will not bind third persons should there be issues on let's say there is sale of a um, third person who says buyer in good faith okay so th those are the three dis distinction of pledge as compared to real mortgage now, Article 2027. Let's go to Article 2027. Um, Article 2027 speaks on the extent of the mortgage. So, what does the law um, stipulate? So, absent express stipulation to the contrary, the mortgage includes accessions, improvements, growing fruits, and income of the property not yet received. Okay, so when the obligation becomes due and to the amount of indemnity granted or owing to the proprietor from the insurers of the property mortgage or in virtue of the expropriation for public use. So this includes not only the property itself. Okay, so the real mortgage constituted on the immovable is not limited to the property itself, but it also extends to its accessions, Okay, let's say it's a house and lot, of course, and there is a, let's say there's a pool or there is fence over it, improvements and and um, other uh, accessions to the property or even growing fruits or income of the property, even if it is not yet received, will also be part of the of of the coverage of that real mortgage. Okay, so. The law is predicated on the assumption that the ownership of such accessions and accessories and improvements subsequently introduced also belongs to the mortgager is the owner of the principal, okay? So it includes all other accessions, ano, kasama pa rin siya. That's Article 2127 of the Civil Code. Now, there is a provision, there was once asked in the bar exam, just recent, siguro mga 2015 or 20, no, not, not so recent, it was already 2021, about a dragnet clause. Okay, so um, the question is, what is dragnet clause? So simple as that one. If you haven't heard about it or you haven't gone over that, that term, you'll have a difficulty on answering kung ganun lang kasimple. Although it was asked uh, in conjunction with parang ano siya, it's a sub-question um, pertaining to real estate mortgage. So um, if you have a clue on that, um, it will, it will uh, guide you on uh, the, 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 the question that is being asked. So... Um, drug debt clause is actually mentioned in one of the uh, 
cases decided by the Supreme Court. Okay, no. So as a general rule, an action to foreclose a mortgage must be limited to the amount mentioned in the mortgage. But the amounts named as consideration in a contract of mortgage do not limit the amount for which the mortgage may stand as a security. If from the corners of the instrument, the intent to secure future loans or advancement and other indebtedness can be gathered. Okay, so drug that means to say it drug sha. It it is to be uh it is a clause in the real estate mortgage um stipulating that uh it will it will subsume all other debts. Okay, it will secure future loans or advancement. Okay, drug net clause. So sometimes it is called blanket, blanket clause. Okay, blanket clause or drug net clause. In American jurisprudence, it was mentioned in drug net clause. So it's one which is specifically phrased to subsume all debts of past or future origin. So such clauses are carefully scrutinized and strictly construed. So particularly where the mortgage contract is one of adhesion, that is, it was prepared solely by the mortgagee and the only participation of the mortgager was affixing his signature on the adhesion there too. So um, in the case of Philippine Bank versus CA, okay, it was ruled out that a mortgage must sufficiently describe the debt sought to be secured. And the obligation is not secured by the mortgage and that is comes fairly with the terms of the mortgage. Now, question, is that clause a valid stipulation? Is it a valid stipulation? Um, it depends upon the uh, terms and conditions of the parties. Okay, so there is no specific prohibition on a inclusion of a dragnet clause in a real mortgage. Okay, so what is a dragnet clause? Again, it's a stipulation that a mortgage is not limited to just to just the fixed amount, but also covers other credit accommodations in excess thereof. So like if you have a property, um, let's say it's worth 100 million and you use that as a real estate mortgage to secure a loan of let's say a 20 million, Okay, so um, the amount is so the amount of the value of the property is so high. So if ever you have succeeding, um, succeeding uh, uh, loans with the same creditor, then it you can you can use the same. There is a provision in the real estate mortgage that the sa that same property should. Um, should subsume the other uh, uh, loans of that creditor. Okay, so it such a stipulation is valid and binding between the parties. Okay, so although there are cases decided by the Supreme Court that if it is only the mortgagee who solely prepared the the contract of real mortgage and there is that uh, uh, principle of adhesion yung the, the, the mortgage are just signed simply and it is caught in unaware of that provision then it is um, considered if there's ambiguity in that one or there is uh, unjust uh, no, enrichment with, the, with that mortgage then um, it's not a valid stipulation. But generally, it's if it's actually um, used in as a continuing and uh, continuing business transaction. Okay, so in the uh, in order to aid a continuous dealing, okay, there is that drug net clause that is being uh, included in a real mortgage. So a mortgage given to secure future advancements enables the parties to provide continuous dealing, the nature or extent of which may not be known 
are anticipated at the time and they avoid the expense and inconvenience of executing a new security on each new transaction. Okay, so a dragnet clause operates as a convenience and accommodation to the borrowers as, as it makes available additional funds. Okay, so two-way siya. It, it, it is to be for the benefit of the debtor, mortgager, and also for the creditor. Okay? So if you'll be asked on this question, what is dragnet clause? You just mentioned those uh, provisions that I uh, discussed to you. Sometimes it's called blanket clause. Huh? Parang sinasaklaw niya all other uh, accommodations for the borrowers, all other uh, new transactions for continuous dealings. All right, then let's go to Article 2128. Article 2128 of the Civil Code provides for the provision or alienation or assignment of mortgage credit. Okay, the mortgage credit may be alienated or assigned to a third person or in whole or in part with the formalities required by law. Okay, so there is assignment of mortgage credit. It could be assigned to third persons. So a mortgage credit or the right of the mortgagee is a real right and directly and immediately subjects the mortgage property to the fulfillment of the principal obligation. So the alienation or assignment is valid even if it is not registered. Okay, so registration is necessary only to affect third persons. All right, so let's go to Article 2130, 2129 and 2130. Um, this these two provisions, these two succeeding provisions pertains to the special rights of the mortgagee and the special rights of a mortgagee. Okay, so what are the special what 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 is that special right as stipulated in Article 2130? So in 2130, the mort it's the right of the mortgagor. Um, we're in. Uh, He has the right to alienate the mortgage property, but the mortgage shall remain attached to the property. Because in 2130, it is, it is um, stated here that the stipulation forbidding the owner from alienating the immovable mortgage shall be void. Okay, Since there is no transfer of ownership, the rationale here, the owner is still, I mean, the, the mortgage or is still the owner of the property and he has the free disposal of that property and if there is a stipulation that the owner or the mortgager cannot sell the property cannot transfer the property that stipulation is void okay it is contrary to public policy in as much as transmission of property should not be unduly impeded okay that's article 2130 Okay, so therefore, the mortgager has that special right to alienate the property. So what will be the effect if the, the property is alienated or transferred? The mortgage would still subsist. It will remain attached to the property. Okay, so if the principal debtor would um, fail in the performance of his principal obligation, the mortgagee can... Um, still foreclose the property even if it is under the uh, hands already of another third person so but if there is foreclosure there is a grant of first refusal okay so the the new owner can be offered to first um, bid over that property okay then article 2129 is the uh, right of the 
mortgagee to claim from a third person in possession of the mortgage property the payment of the part of the credit secured by which said person possesses. Okay, so it is necessary that prior demand for payment must have been made on the debtor and the latter failed to pay. So the right of the creditor against the transfer of the property. So the mortgagee creditor here can claim from that third person the possession, okay? If it is in the hands of another third person, diba? If a, so a recorded real estate mortgage is merely an accessory contract. It is inseparable from the property. There, though, regardless, so the owner may subsequently be. Okay, so that's the that's the rationale there. So yeah, that's the case of BPI versus Conception and EHOS Incorporated. Okay, so this is the provision of the law on the right of the creditor against the transferee and the provision on the stipulation forbidding the owner from alienating, which is considered as null and void. So the law considers void any stipulation forbidding the owner from alienating. So it is contrary to public good in as much as the transmission of the property should be unduly stipulated but a stipulation granting the right of ref first refusal is valid so there is nothing wrong in a stipulation granting the mortgagee the right of first refusal over the mortgage property in the event that the mortgager decides to sell the same okay so if the mortgager decides to sell it the mortgagee has the right the first refusal. So he will be offered to buy first the property. Kasi nga naka mortgage sa kanya. Okay? Alright. Moving on. Okay. So the real mortgage particularly on the concept of foreclosure um, is governed not only by the Civil Code of the Philippines, but also by the Land Registration Law, by the Revised Administrative Act, particularly um, 3344, and also the PD-1529, or what you call Property Registration Decree. Okay, And the most important thing, especially on extrajudicial foreclosure is the Act 3135 as amended by Act 4118. What is foreclosure? What is foreclosure? What is the concept of foreclosure? Foreclosure is the remedy available to the mortgagee by which he subjects the mortgage property to the satisfaction of the obligation to secure that for which the mortgage was given. So it's a remedy. It is the basic course of action of the mortgagee creditor if there is failure to comply with a principal obligation. Okay, so it presupposes something than a mere demand to surrender possession of the object of the property. Okay, so foreclosure is but a necessary consequence of a non-payment. Okay. Um, as a rule, the mortgage can be foreclosed only when the debt remains unpaid at the time it is due. Okay, so there should be those um, provisions in the case of BPI versus Court of Appeals. It was ruled out by the Supreme Court that the unpaid that the debt should be, should be unpaid at the time it is due before the mortgagee or creditor can avail of this remedy of foreclosure okay so other decisions of the supreme court um foreclosure denotes the procedure adopted by the mortgagee to terminate the rights of the mortgagor on the property and includes the sale itself in dbp versus saragoza so the mortgagee terminates the right of the mortgagor kumbaga since the mortgager failed to comply with this obligation, the mortgagee has to um, proceed with 
either judicial foreclosure or extrajudicial foreclosure depending upon the agreement of the parties. And in the case of Gobin Singh Jr. versus CA, it ruled out that the foreclosure is valid when the debtor is in default in the payment of his obligation. So if the debt is not yet due, foreclosure is not yet the proper remedy. What are the kinds of foreclosure? What are the kinds of foreclosure? Um, as mentioned, you have your judicial foreclosure. It is an ordinary action for foreclosure under Rule 68 of the Rules of Court. I don't know if you're done with your special proceedings. This is part of the special proceedings, Rules of Court. Rule 68, um, it's an action of for, for foreclosure, which is with aid of the court. You go to the court and ask that this um, real mortgage be foreclosed. Later on, we will go over the details of how uh, mortgagee or a creditor um, uh, apply the provisions of the rules of court and the procedures to be followed. Second kind of foreclosure is the extrajudicial foreclosure out of court. So when the mortgagee is given a special power of attorney to sell the mortgage property by public auction, this is governed by Act Number 3135, the one that I mentioned to you on the special law governing extrajudicial foreclosure of real mortgage, Act 3135. So what is the distinction of the two? Judicial foreclosure and extrajudicial foreclosure. So in judicial foreclosure, there is court intervention, whereas in extrajudicial, there is no court intervention. Judicial foreclosure, the decisions are appealable. And in extrajudicial, it is not appealable because it is immediately executory. Now, in judicial, the orders of the court cuts off all rights of the parties implicated, whereas in extrajudicial, the foreclosure does not cut off all rights parties involved. Now, other distinction is in judicial foreclosure, there is equity of redemption. Okay, equity, you call it equity of redemption if it is done through judicial foreclosure. If it is done through extrajudicial, the redemption uh, is what you call right of redemption. Later on, we will distinguish the two. Right of redemption, what is the period within which to redeem, and so on and so forth. Okay, so also another distinction in judicial foreclosure, the period of redemption starts from the finality of the judgment until... Uh, order of confirmation until order of confirmation. So, whereas in extrajudicial, the period to redeem starts from the date of registration of the certificate of sale. Okay, so there is uh, a big difference on counting as to when would the period of redemption commence, when would it start. Okay, so, so judicial finality of the judgment. And the other extrajudicial, it's on the registration of the certificate of sale. Now, in judicial foreclosure also, there is no need for a special power of attorney in the contract of mortgage, whereas in extrajudicial, there is a need for a special power of attorney. Okay, it's needed. In the case of St. Dominic Corporation versus IAC, it was ruled out by the Supreme Court that the, a foreclosure sale retroacts to the date of registration of the mortgage and that a person who takes a mortgage in good faith and for valuable consideration, the record showing clear title to the mortgagor will be protected against equitable claims on title in favor of third person of which he has no actual or constructive notice, okay? So it retroacts to the date of registration of the mortgage, saying that that's why it becomes a notice to the whole world. So if there's a clear title of the mortgage or um, such right of that person who takes the mortgage in good faith will be protected against equitable claims on the title of in favor of a third person. 
Okay? So, as long as the mortgage is properly done, once there is a proper, also proper procedure of the foreclosure, that um, mortgage or that person who takes the mortgage in good faith and for valuable consideration will be upheld. The right of that person will be upheld. Now, take note also that um, where there is a right to redeem, inadequacy of the price is not material. Okay, right to redeem. Okay, on the extrajudicial foreclosure. Because the judgment debtor may reacquire the property or else sell his re right to redeem and thus recover any loss he claims to have suffered by reason of the price obtained at the auction sale and consequently not sufficient to set aside the sale. So it doesn't mean if the the bid price is is in is low or so there's inadequacy of the price. Okay, it's still a valid say. Uh, public auction or public sale. So the mere inadequacy of the price obtained at the sheriff's sale will not be sufficient to set aside the sale unless the price is so inadequate as to shock the conscience of the court, okay? Taking into consideration the peculiar circumstances attendant thereto. So in this case of Sulit versus CA, um, it was um, added by the Supreme Court that if in case the price is so inadequate, as to shock the conscience of the court, then that um, sheriff's sale, okay, so sheriff's public auction shall be set aside. Okay. Now, another thing to consider, like in should there be made a balance due to the mortgagee after applying the process of the sale, the mortgagee is entitled to recover the deficiency. Okay. If it, even this 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 rule that we have um, discussed in in pledge that deficiency cannot be recovered if there is excess it will be um, the pledge I mean yeah the pledge will be entitled to the excess but if there is deficiency he cannot recover to the from that of the pledger um, but in real estate mortgage um, the mortgagee is entitled to recover the ver the deficiency if the balance of the loan is not sufficiently covered by the proceeds of the sale okay so this rule applies both to judicial and extrajudicial real estate mortgage And the action to recover deficiency after the foreclosure prescribes after 10 years from the time of the action, right of action accrues. Okay, so there is a um, prescriptive period within which to file the deficiency. So that's 10 years from the foreclosure sale. Okay. So validity and effect of foreclosure. So foreclosure is but a necessary consequence of non-payment of a mortgage indebtedness. And as a rule, the mortgage can be foreclosed only when the debt remains unpaid at the time it is due. Okay, Producers Bank of the Philippines versus CA. It's a 2001 case decided by the Supreme Court. And there's also one um, case, it's uh, a recent uh, uh, where in the, the Supreme Court mentioned about acceleration clause, Acceler acceleration clause. So, I mean, a drug net clause, blanket clause. There is also the concept of acceleration clause. So, what is an acceleration clause? Um, it is a stipulation stating that on the occasion of the mortgagor's default, the whole sum remaining unpaid automatically becomes due and demandable. So the failure of the mortgagor to pay any installment will trigger the activation of this acceleration clause. So why is it called acceleration? It's because it, it will make the entire debt become due and demandable if there is uh, uh, 
default on the part of the mortgager. For instance, the loan of, let's say, 10 million to be paid on a monthly uh, monthly installment, let's say, of uh, 100,000. Now, for a period of two years, sabihin na natin ganun. Now, if it will not, if the mortgage or debtor will not pay, let's say, three monthly amortization, the entire debt will become due and demandable. Meaning to say, it will be subject to sore charges, interest, and penalties. The entire debt. It's called acceleration clause. Okay? So, the failure of the mortgager to pay any installment will trigger the activation of the acceleration clause and gives the mortgagee the right to foreclose the mortgage against the contention of prematurity. Kasi, di ba, we mentioned that there is no cause of action of foreclosure if the debt um is not yet due and demandable okay so but if ever there is that acceleration clause that that will entirely become due and demandable if there is a provision and it was agreed upon by the mortgager and the mortgagee on the non-payment of certain installment or amortization okay so that's the case of luzon development bank versus conquilia Okay, so those are matters, uh, concepts pertaining to foreclosure. Okay, um, there's also a another um, case, which is the BPI case versus Yulo, on the use of the word upset price or tipo. Please take note also of this concept, tipo or up upset price. What is this stipulation? It is a stipulation in a mortgage of real property of minimum price at which the property shall be sold to become operative in the event of a foreclosure sale at public auction. It is null and void for the property because the property should be sold to the highest bidder. So um, it is a set price, kumbaga, minimum price at which the property shall be, shall be sold. So it is a null and void. It's not a valid stipulation. The upset or tipo price is not a valid stipulation. So parties cannot by agreement contravene the law and interfere with the lawful procedure of the courts. Because what is the concept of a foreclosure? If there is a public auction, it must be sold to the highest bidder. So walang minimum price. Let's say the highest bidder, let's say the the they, they set it to be sold at 10 million loan is 10 million and the new highest bidder mo lang is 3 million 2 million how that gonna be failure of ano failure of bid but in that particular case that upset price or tipo is a null and void stipulation it's not a valid stipulation okay as decided by the supreme court in the case of bpi versus yolo Now, let's go to the specific procedures of judicial foreclosure under the rules of court. So again, this is governed by Rule 68 of the Rules of Court. So what is a judicial foreclosure? Judicial foreclosure, it's a judicial action wherein the mortgage is foreclosed judicially by bringing an action for that purpose. So the action is for judicial foreclosure in the proper court which has jurisdiction over the area wherein the real property involved or the portion thereof is situated. So the venue is where the property, the mortgage property is situated. Okay. So proper court which has jurisdiction. Okay. Uh, it's actually the regional trial court having jurisdiction over the uh, place where the property is situated. Now, if the court finds the complaint to be well-founded, it shall order the mortgager to pay the amount due upon the mortgage debt 
or obligation with interest and other charges within a period of not less than 90 days or more than 120 days from the entry of judgment. Okay, so once the once the mortgagor was not able to pay, um, there will be a sale to the highest bidder at public auction. Okay, if the mortgagor fails to pay at the time directed in the order of the court. Okay, so the, the court upon motion okay, by the other party, which is the mortgagee, shall order the property to be sold to the highest bidder at public auction. Then there is the confirmation of sale. So what is a confirmation of sale? The sale shall be confirmed um, by the order of the court also upon motion. Okay, shall operate to divest the rights of all the properties to the action and to vest their rights in the purchaser subject to such right of redemption as may be allowed by law. So if there is already termination of the public auction and it was already awarded to a purchaser, okay, the highest bidder of the property, then it will be confirmed. The sale shall be confirmed by the court. There, should, should, there is confirmation of sale. Okay, before the confirmation of a judicial foreclosure sale, the court retains control of the proceedings by exercising a sound discretion in regard to it. So either granting or withholding confirmation of rights and interest to the parties and the ends of justice may require. So from this standpoint, any order which neither set aside or confirms the, the foreclosure is merely interlocutory, okay? Okay, so then there, the next procedure is the execution of sheriff's certificate okay so the foreclosure is not complete until there is a sheriff's certificate okay the sheriff's certificate that will be executed acknowledged and recorded So in the absence of a certificate of sale, no title passes to by the foreclosure proceedings to the vendee. So it is only when the foreclosure proceedings are completed that the mortgage property sold to the purchaser that the interest of the mortgager are cut off from the property. Okay, so that will be the specific uh, provisions of the rules of court. Okay, on judicial judicial foreclosure. That is the execution of the sheriff's certificate. And that sheriff's certificate shall be acknowledged and recorded. Okay. It will be recorded in the in the uh, registry of property before the register of deeds. And if there is no certificate of sale, no title shall pass. Shall be passed on okay no title passes by the foreclosure proceedings to the vendee all right so um those are the by the way if you want to go onto the details of the extra judicial i mean judicial foreclosure you can also uh read on the appendix of the book on uh, judicial foreclosure, okay, which is Rule 68 of the Rules of Court. Then we have judicial extrajudicial foreclosure of real property under Act 3135. Okay, so let's just um, move on with our uh, discussion. 
um, this Act 3135 is the law which covers on, which covers only real estate mortgage. So it is intended to regulate the extrajudicial sale of property if and when the mortgagee is given a special power of express authority to do so in the deed itself or in a document annexed thereto. Okay, so there is that special power of attorney to to um to enter into extrajudicial foreclosure. Okay, so from the time there is the execution of the real estate mortgage, there is that another document which is a special power of attorney for the mortgagee to proceed to extra for extrajudicial foreclosure. Okay. Um, this is also done in public auction. Okay. So this is usually done by uh, banks, by uh, let's say the 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 pag-ibig pag uh, who extends housing loans, okay, the real estate mortgage over the property which is subject to the loan of with the pag-ibig um aside from the uh mortgage agreement or mortgage contract there is that special power of attorney okay that is to be signed by the mortgage or and the mortgage in favor of the mortgage now in in the same law it is um also ruled out especially when the supreme court um rendered its decision in the case of paris versus pnb that the authority to sell is not extinguished by the death of the mortgage or, or the mortgagee as is it as it is essential and inseparable part of the bilateral agreement Okay, the authority to sell, the authority to to um, engage in the foreclosure sale, okay, it's not extinguished by the death of either the mortgage or in the mortgage, so it will subsist. It will bind the ears and the assigns of that um, mortgage or or mortgage as the case may be. Okay, and no sale can be legally made outside the province in which the sale. The property sold is situated so kailangan it is where the the public auction the public sale shall be made in the same province in which the property is situated and in case the place and in case the place within the said province in which the sale is to be made is subject of such a stipulation such sale shall be made in the place in the municipal building or municipality in which the property or part thereof is situated Okay. Uh, this would be the last part of our of our discussion this afternoon on the procedures of uh, extrajudicial foreclosure under Act three one three five. Okay. So first is um, the filing of the application before an executive judge through a clerk of court, okay? And then the clerk of court will examine whether the requirement of the law has been complied with, that is whether the notice of sale has been posted for not less than 20 days in at least three public places in the municipality or city where the property is situated. Okay, um, and then the certificate of sale must be approved by the executive judge. Then the application concerns extrajudicial foreclosure of real mortgage in different locations covering one indebtedness. Only one filing fee corresponding to the such debt shall be collected. Then after which the clerk of court shall issue the certificate of payment indicating the amount of indebtedness, the filing fees collected, the mortgages sought to be foreclosed, and the description of the real estates and their respective locations. Now, the notice of sale shall be published in a newspaper of general circulation. 
okay? After which the application shall be raffled among all sheriffs, okay? And then after the redemption period has expired, the clerk of court shall archive the records. Now, in cases there is no auction sale, now, and, and another thing to consider is no auction sale shall be held unless there are at least two participating bidders. Otherwise, the sale shall be postponed to another date. So if one of the dates set for the sale, there shall not be at least two bidders, the sale shall then proceed. So the names of the bidders should be reported to the sheriffs of the notary public who conducted the sale, the clerk of court, before the issuance of the certificate of sales. Okay, so um, those are the important things to consider in case there is extrajudicial foreclosure for real estate mortgage. Now, things to consider also under Republic Act. Um, 3135 or the Real Estate Mortgage Act, for extrajudicial foreclosure of real estate mortgage. Okay, so the mortgager and the mortgage G have no right to waive the posting and publication requirements. So there should be proper postings but in, in uh, three consecutive weeks in a newspaper of general circulation or in three public places in a particular municipality. So notices are given to secure bidders and prevent the sacrifice of the property. So clearly the statutory requirements of posting the publications are mandated. So failure to comply with such um, statutory requirements as to publication constitutes a jurisdictional defect and therefore it will invalidate the sale, okay? So that's very important in publication. So lack of republication also would render the sale void. Okay. Now section three of our 8135 does not require personal or any particular notice on the mortgage or much less than successor interest where there is no contractual stipulation thereof. So neither the section three requires posting of notice of mortgage property or certificate of postings that requires indispensable for the validity of the foreclosure sale. Okay, so, um, so those are the important provisions of the uh, extrajudicial foreclosure under Act 3135. So it should be proper notice, there should be public sale and also uh, publication in the newspaper of general circulation. Then the concept of redemption. So let's go to the concept of redemption. So redemption is the transaction by which the mortgage or we acquires or buys back the property. Um, which have been passed under the mortgage or divest the property of the land which the mortgage has may be created. So when you say redemption, um, kailangan uh, na foreclosed na. Na foreclosed na yung property and the mortgage or, or the original owner wants to reacquire the property okay so that's why it's called redemption you redeem back the property okay that has been already foreclosed okay so the sale by the mortgage or to a third person of the mortgage property during the period for redemption transfers only the right to redeem the property and the right to possess use or or enjoy the same so there are two kinds of redemption. You call it equity of redemption and the right of redemption. We mentioned a while ago, the equity of redemption applies to judicial foreclosure. So it is the right of the mortgagor to redeem the mortgage property after his default in the performance of the conditions of the mortgage within 90 days. So there is that specific period, 90 days, from the date of service of the order of foreclosure or even thereafter, but before the confirmation of sale. Please take note of this one. When is that equity of redemption can be validly exercised? Okay, so 
within 90 days from the date of the service of the order of foreclosure, okay, or before the confirmation of sale. So it's called equity of redemption. This is, a, this is applicable to judicial foreclosure of real mortgage and um, judicial foreclosure of chattel mortgage, okay? But in banks, institu banking institutions, even if it's judicial foreclosure, the equity of redemption is uh, one year from the confirmation of sale. From the confirmation of sale. On the other hand, if it would be through a judicial, extrajudicial foreclosure of real mortgage, the proper remedy is the right of redemption. Okay, so the right of the mortgage or to redeem the mortgage property within one year. So take note of the reckoning date. From what date? From what date? From the date of registration of the certificate of sale. Magkaiba yan, di ba? Magkaiba. So dito, um, from the confirmation of sale, dito naman sa extrajudicial foreclosure, one year from the date of registration of the certificate of sale. Okay. But if it is uh, individual, not a banking institution, if it's equity redemption, it is only 90 days. 90 days from the date of service of the order of foreclosure. Okay. The right of redemption, as long as within the period prescribed, may be exercised, irrespective of whether or not the mortgagee has subsequently conveyed the property to some other persons. So if it is... Um, the mortgage already sold it to another person, that third person is still bound with the right of redemption. It will still subsist. It will be validly exercised against whoever will be the uh, current owner or possessor of that property. Okay, so the period of redemption, ito, just for you to be emphasized, just to emphasize to you the concepts, if it's natural person, extrajudicial, one year from the registration, okay? One year from the registration of the certificate of sale, whether it's a natural person or a juridical person. You say juridical person, corporations, uh, partnerships. And if the juridical person is a bank in, if, in extrajudicial foreclosure, that is just three months after the foreclosure or before the certification of the foreclosure, whichever is earlier. But if the foreclosure that has been conducted is a judicial, that is 90 days, okay? 90 days from the issue once, but before the confirmation of sale by the court, necessarily before the confirmation of the sale by the court. And take note also that allowing a redemption after the lapse of the statutory period when the buyer at the foreclosure sale does not object, but even consents to the redemption, will uphold the policy of the law, which is to aid rather than to defeat the right of redemption. Okay, but there is um, assent to the to the uh, redemption, even if it is beyond, it will still be um, upheld. Okay, it will be still be upheld. There is nothing in the law which prevents a waiver of statutory period of redemption. Okay, pero but if it will be objected upon by the by the mortgagee or let's say the present um, owner of the property, kasi beyond na he cannot exercise it anymore. But that um, right can be waived by the mortgagee or the buyer. Okay. So what will be the redemption price? What would comprise the redemption price? Okay, if, if the mortgagee is not a bank, meaning it's just a juridical person or another individual, it would involve first the purchase price of the property. Second, plus the 1% interest per month on the purchase price. Plus taxes paid and amount of the purchasers prior to the lien, if any, with the same rate of interest computed from the date of registration of the sale up to the time of redemption, okay? Okay, so that is if the mortgagee is not a bank, okay? It's just a ordinary, let's say, lending institution or lending individual, okay? If the mortgagee is a bank under the general banking law, the redemption price would include the amount due under the mortgage deed plus the interest and the cost and expenses. Okay, 
the interest of the bank. Okay, so redemption price in this case is reduced by the income received by the property in both cases. And with that, I hope you learned something from our discussion. This is Attorney Luana Gokong saying thank you for listening. Have a great day.